Welcome to Live, Laugh, Love Real Estate, conversations with Lisa Loveland and Costa Hansis. Now, we told you last episode that we were going to have a surprise as to what we were doing this week, and our surprise is Richard Gordon. Welcome, Richard. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Nice to see you on Costa. Um, Richard is the owner of the South End Buttery, and we wanted to have him on because we'd like to um, do some outreach into the business community to find out um, you know, how you started, promote your give you a, some promotion in the business and you've been in the south end a long time you're kind of a trailblazer and uh, i've known richard for years and um so welcome oh thank you thank you I'm thrilled to be here this is great um I, i've lived in the south end for almost 30 years and and um about 16 or 17 years ago i decided that i wanted to leave the practice of law where i had been working um, primarily in the attorney general's office for most mm -hmm. of my legal career, and before that um, in the district attorney's office um, under Scott Harshbarger, so I could show you how old I am. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not, not to disparage Scott, he's an amazing guy. Um, <laughs> but um, I, you know, I, my, my partner and I at the time decided that um, we wanted to open a little like neighborhood coffee shop because mm -hmm. there really weren't a lot of great places to go, um, particularly early in the day um, right. in the South End and even in the city. But um, the places that you could go were primarily chains. And um, we decided that, you know, we would really do a, a great neighborhood kind of um, spot where, you, you know, we could have um, great food, great coffee. Um, specialty coffee wasn't really a big thing at that time. Mm -hmm. And so um, we decided that we would go with the great, um, I don't even think people used the, the phrase third wave back then um, to describe coffee, but um, they did. Um, and um, so we, we chose to use a, a company out in California, actually. Okay. And um, Equator Coffee is their name, so give them a little promotion. Yep. <laughs> um, and, you know, uh, they were being used by chefs like Thomas Keller, um, you know, served their coffee in his restaurants. And so we mm -hmm. figured if Thomas Keller, is, this is good enough coffee for Thomas <laughs> Keller, this is exactly what we are looking to do is, mm -hmm. to, you know, kind of like introduce really great um, food and drink to the South End. Um, awesome. So that's how we ended up doing that and uh, never looked back. <laughs> Wonderful. What were some of the difficulties you found in starting out? Well, um, yeah, primarily when we first started, um, I would say that dealing with governmental bureaucracy, I guess, um, it, to, to put it plainly, um, you know, and all of the hoops that you really needed to go through to get approvals for doing things that, I mean, we, we always wanted to do and did and still do everything by the book. I mean, mm -hmm. th that probably comes from my- You're an my attorney. Back, my, my background <laughs> as an attorney and right. as, a, as, a, yeah. as a criminal prosecutor, you know, I mean, I believe in doing things the right way yes. and ethically, um, and that's, you know, part of my, my mentality. But um, I think um, that has really changed a lot with, especially in, in the last year and a half to two years, particularly since COVID. Um, you know, hit, yeah. uh, hit us. The city has really been very um, cooperative and helpful, even um, to you know help help um, with getting approvals for things yeah. that were previously very difficult. Like the outdoor seating. I, I mean, yeah. I love walking around um, the South End. It feels very European with all the outdoor. Yeah. Uh, you know, the extension. Uh, I mean, it was number. I don't know how many years ago I've lived in the South End for a long time as well. And we were so excited when they were expanding the sidewalks on Washington Street so that there would be outdoor seating for restaurants. And now we're actually in the street. Um, do you think that that's, and I love it. Um, uh, yeah, it's great. Do you think the city's going to keep that? You know, there's been some talk about it. Um, and, you know, we, we are, we're hopeful they, that they will do that. Um, we, like a lot of restaurants in the South End and in the city, have invested in putting together and presenting really nice outdoor seating, yeah. um, making them, it really give the look and feel of being in Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, we do hope that was our, that was our hope when we did the, made the investment in um, putting in these great decks. Um, yeah. And also we're, we're planning on doing the same thing at our other location. Um, on Clarendon? On Clarendon Street. Wonderful. Yeah. I think, um, you know, the South End has always been such an, a neighborhood feel. It's, it's one of the um, really, one of the only neighborhoods in Boston that actually has their commercial and their residential intermixed. And I think that's what 
one of the reasons it gives it such a vibrancy is because you you just walk right out of your door and you can grab a cup of coffee, you can do, go shopping, you can grab dinner. Um, and there's always been such a communal feel. And I think right now, especially coming out of this, this um, COVID crises, community is so important. And when you see people out on the street and having dinner and having yeah. a drink and walking their dogs or taking their kids out for a walk, it just really adds to that energy of the environment. So I hope, um, at least for the short term, that they, they keep that outdoor seating. Well, I mean, we're behind other cities that do it. It is a permanent part of um, the landscape in, mm -hmm. uh, it, for restaurants in other cities. So hopefully, you know, that hopefully Boston will catch up in a way. Yeah, we've always I been a little conservative to... <laughs> and late to that party. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like they're like the city really is open to that, mm -hmm. um, and they've been really they've been really supportive. I have to say, they've been amazing to work with in terms of helping you know helping you get to the point where you would meet the requirements because the, some of them are pretty are pretty onerous and then some of them are not you know it's mm -hmm. just it's it's easy to do the right thing um what you know, are some of the it, requirements um well there are a lot of requirements around electricity um for example um rightfully so you know I mean, you don't want to have you know you don't want to create a hazardous situation right um by allowing restaurants to put up um you know for example, heaters that you know, um, or electric or um, lighting, or um, extension cords. Extension right. cords, like yeah, well, you know, like they have to be covered by a, like a bumper yeah. type thing on the sidewalk, and can have things that are overhead by a certain height because of um, ADA requirements, and you know, so it's all good stuff. I mean, it's all like stuff that's easy to comply with and say, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the right thing to do. So I'm not going to be a jerk and you know just push back, do whatever it, yeah. I feel like doing. Um, but um, you know, there's certain um, distance requirements. Like you can only go out so far from the curb, and again, mm -hmm. rightfully so. So you're not jutting out into the street. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, what are some of the stresses that you've had throughout the years? Obviously, you know, COVID is one. Opening a new business is is the other. But what are some of the day to day things that you find yourself having to you overcome? Know, Prime, I would say the, the, the biggest challenge has been still, and now it's even harder, is staffing. Um, like really finding people you can rely on to, to represent your image or your, you know, what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it's very hard to find really good people who are going to be committed to the goal and the, yeah. um, you know, the motives behind our motives were, you don't, you don't, you're not going to become really rich in this business. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what, you know, unless you become someone like, um, you know, a master chef. If you are a master chef like Ina Garten or something like mm -hmm. that, you know, where you have shows and she's fantastic and she's fabulous. So she is able to promote herself through herself and books and, right. you know, but um, in terms of, you know, an average guy like me opening a restaurant with no previous experience, you know, you have to really rely on other people to help you do it. Yeah. And I think that's been the biggest challenge, I think, is finding people who are committed to what you believe in and mm -hmm. the same standards that you believe in, which are the reasons that we opened, was to, was to do something that, um, you know, represented high quality, fresh, um, yep. great service, you know, I, all those things that, you know, you expect, you know, when you walk into a, yeah. a restaurant or a cafe. Yeah. The personal branding is huge, as you just said. That, like the celebrity chef is like, everybody wants to be a, a social media influencer right now. And but quite frankly, it's with Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and different things like that. There's no longer those gatekeepers we talked about in the previous yeah. episode. Yeah. There's no longer as much of a barrier of entry. A kid that's I like go on TikTok a lot, maybe a little bit too much, but there's <laughs> always those. Um, there's different ones, but there's different chefs and cooking. Of course, they do different things like that. Cooking, uh, there's real estate people on TikTok, different things like that. But there's a lot of cooking people that just do like quick, funny little entertaining video clips. And all of a sudden they got millions of followers. And somebody might say in a, a common thing that comes up is, oh, like, are you going to make money off of that? Or what are you going to do with all those followers and stuff like that? But especially now you have all that followers, you have those audience, those people, then they can branch off and do brand deals. And maybe if it gets big enough, open a restaurant and create a, a personal brand right. around their name, which wasn't as per se as common unless you had a lot of connections in the industry, had a lot of money backing you. But now, and a lot of things too, the barrier of entry for social media, stuff like that is different. There's mm -hmm. so much more reach by j just sitting behind your phone. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's no, unbelievable. Absolutely. 
And what, how would you describe, I think I have a good idea of your mindset and your philosophy on life, but um, we like to, to kind of talk about that on, on the podcast as well. Just it's so, I find it, I find people fascinating. Um, and I like to know what makes them tick. Costa does as well. It's, we're always talking about, you know, different ways of looking at things, different ways of, um, you know, skinning that cat. Is there a better way to do something? And it all comes down to your, your mindset and, and how you goal set and how you achieve personal and professional goals. So there was a kind of a lot of questions in that, in that <laughs> one, but, um, how would you describe yourself as far as your energy, your mindset and high cycles? Well, I think, you know, I've always believed this, but I really believe it even more so now as a business owner that you should treat people like you want to be treated. And that's what I try to instill in everybody that I interact with every day. Um, yeah. but particularly my staff, I want them, it doesn't matter if it's a, delivery driver coming in or a customer or uh, they don't or they don't even know who the person is mm -hmm. um, they should treat them all equally with respect and dignity and and you know it doesn't matter what race you are or religion or you know anything um, yep. ethnic background gender you know sexual orientation everything everybody should be treated the same way so um, I mean Bef when I was a lawyer, I was part of my job the last four years in the Attorney General's office was as Deputy Chief of the Civil Rights Division. So I managed, actually, my, my particular area um, that I managed was um, hate crimes. And so I saw a lot of bad things, and I dealt with a lot of difficult issues. Yeah. And I, I, that, it, I took with me, I think, from, the, from that experience, mm -hmm. something that I've always believed anyway, but, and I continue to, that my philosophy is that you should really treat people um, the way that you want to be treated. Yeah, yeah. And since the, those days, um, how have you seen the, the neighborhood change? Uh, well, um, the diversity has changed, I guess. Um, it used, they used to be a more diverse, racially more diverse, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be, there, there, isn't, there wasn't the probably prosperity that's there now, mm -hmm. um, I guess, when I first moved in in the early 90s. But, um, you know, it also has grown into um, a great neighborhood where it attracts people and restaurants and, and small businesses. Great little shops have opened, you know, that yeah. weren't there, didn't used to be there. So, I mean, it has a vitality, I think, that it didn't used to have. Mm -hmm. But it's also lost... Of course, in that process, a lot of the kind of um, the residential aspect of it, mm -hmm. you know, lots of big buildings have gone up and, right. you know, um, it's changed the, the feel of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Not for, not, you know, it's not a bad thing um, necessarily. I, I think, you know, that, that's actually helped to the businesses to, to grow themselves too. I mean, I that, that helps bringing more people to the neighborhood to vi even if just for a day, but also mm -hmm. more people to live there in condo in all the you know large buildings that have opened right. um, that have opened up and are still being built. Remember when Tremont Street used to be called Restaurant Row and there were just a couple of restaurants yeah. on Tremont Street? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, no one would even think of going down to Washington Street. Right. Well, right. I, I went down to Washington Street. I thought about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was all alone there. Um, so it's it's. Um, I always say that Boston was kind of the city of late bloomers. You know, where what other cities do you really see that, that you know, were strong economically that had land um, that wasn't built on? Right. Um, and uh, so, you know, anytime you do that kind of build, it can't help but change the fabric of the neighborhood. Um, you know, people, you know, property values increase, people move out of the neighborhood and then you know, people complain that the neighborhood has changed. Um, right. So uh, I kind of like seeing the change. Um, I liked it. I liked both versions of it. It was fun when it was, you know, we were all sitting on the stoops having wine at night, and <laughs> now we get to go to, you know, restaurants and, and do things right. like that. And there's a multitude of restaurants to choose from. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, what happens in the next year or so with some of the big spaces um, that, like, like Stella. You know that that's a big space on right. Washington Street. Um, used to be a, a really popular hangout place, and it'll be interesting to see what what happens with these spaces and restaurants. Any idea, what are your thoughts on what's going to happen to the industry and the, those vacancies? I don't know. I, I I suspect a lot of them will not come back as restaurants. Yeah. Um, 
it's difficult to open a big restaurant now. Right. right. Um, yeah. um, and it's really hard. The, the headaches and challenges that you have with finding great staff, you know, just finding them and keeping them and, you know, I mean, things have changed a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, I think it, I think a lot of those places, I've seen it already that a lot of places haven't come back as restaurants. Yeah. Yeah. I think I can relate to when you said that whole idea of employees, you want to get employees that trust and share the same vision, which is definitely tough. Um, it kind of reminded me of me and Lisa's story because Lisa, of course, has been in the business for a while now and as a solo agent. And as we kept talking more and more, came to the realization that she had a vision for different things like that, but it was tough to find somebody who exactly shared and wanted to to grow the business as much. It's tough to find people in the same thing if, in terms of you, in terms of uh, cafe, people that want to genuinely help and see the business grow will go above and beyond, will do different things like that. And that's really tough. Some people are just in it for the paycheck, even though they might say otherwise, but it's the people that kind of, I'm sure, stay later, offer to do more, especially during COVID. I was talking to um, some friends because of course we were talking about unemployment and different things like that. People work from home um, in restaurants all over the country here and that it's tough to get staffing and find people, especially during COVID because the unemployment benefits and different things like that just changed the landscape. And I was saying to one of them, and just similar to you, um, especially during this time, for example, if I was at like a restaurant or working there, I would think you would want to work above and beyond because if somebody was you, for example, I don't know your staffing situation, but say you were short staffed, um, if one employee stepped up and was like, I'll do whatever it takes, I'll take a pay cut, I'll work more, more hours, whatever it is, that has a long lasting benefit for years and years and that they'll never forget. And it's just mind blowing that people don't want to work. I don't get it. I know. I don't well, get it. and eventually they're going to have to. They're going uh, you know, to have to. Um, it's like, wow. I, I feel like a lot, of, a lot of people, I think, in, this, in the restaurant industry have decided that they don't want to go back to it because it is a stressful business, you mm-hmm. know, and maybe it gave them a, an opportunity to step back from it and say, Hey, you know what? It's <laughs> not, not really for me. <laughs> right. I was doing it all these years, but now I have an opportunity to think about doing something else. Um, they did, you know, they're, they're getting some government benefit, but it also gave them a chance to, to look at other things and take courses maybe, you know, in something right. else um, and decide to move into a different, a different profession. It's hard to make that transition, though. I mean, right. I, I think it sounds good on paper, and I, I certainly don't mean to be negative. But it's you know, I'm going to go re- retool myself. But where are those jobs? Yeah, you know, it's tough. Um, and then if you don't have um, uh, you know the workers in the restaurants, that's going to affect everything we just talked about about the vibrancy of these neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, if you don't have the staffing to to stay open, I know that they're having all kinds of trouble like that down in the Cape. Mm, um, you know, um, some of the restaurants I went up to were saying, you know, we're not even going to uh, expand. Uh, you know, right. uh, you know where the limits are all going away now. We, we can't. Yeah. We could have 35 more seats in here, but we'd never be able to handle it because we don't have cooks in the kitchen. We don't have the wait staff. We don't have the bus people. Um, so there's all kinds of trickle down uh, effects of COVID, obviously, and of um, being able to make more money on unemployment than you can going to actual work. Well, um, you know this, um, but I think a lot of our a lot of our customers don't know that we have a restaurant and bar as well as the coffee shop cafe. Yeah. We are, are we're we're multifaceted. We have a bakery, our own bakery. We have a, a takeout market um, where we make prepared foods that some of them are different than the foods that we would serve you if you sat down and had dinner or lunch. Mm-hmm. But um, some of them are the exact same thing, just in a package for you to take home and make at home. Um, some people just want to do that and don't want, and actually during COVID, like a lot of people didn't want to go out, um, but they would go out, mm-hmm. come in, buy some stuff and then leave, go home and have it. Um, and it's our, delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. you do a great job. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but the, um, but the restaurant and bar is, you know, we, we haven't been able to be open more than three days a week uh, yeah. because we haven't had the staff to do it. We're hoping actually, within the next week or so that we'll be able to reopen every night or even more nights. Um, we are open brunch um, Saturday and Sunday. Okay. Um, and that is like insanely busy, luckily. Um, yes. It's nice nice to see that people like love to get out, but it's, um, but the dinner, we've been busy, be, you know, because they're weekend nights, I think. Right. But the dinner, um, you know, we just haven't been able to, to 
get the, the right, we don't want to just hire people for the sake of it. And then also when you do that, we also have to train them before we put them on the floor. So right. we don't want to just, it's a process. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. people are always asking, why aren't you open more nights of the week? And that's the reason why, yeah. unfortunately, right now. So hopefully that'll change. Um, but, you know, we uh, th this whole um, time that we've been, you know, what's it been now, like a, a year and three months or so? Yeah. Um, yeah. We had to lay off, sadly, most of our staff, or not, well, about three quarters of it anyway. Yeah, that's um, got to be, you know, that's hard. It was really yeah. hard to do. Um, it was very Because you've got to be sad. like family. Yeah. Oh, you know? It, oh, yeah. We're, we're, we're still a small business, you know? Mm -hmm. We're a big small business in a way. I mean, right. we had like 70 employees, 75 employees between wow. both locations. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Wow. between um, Between Shama, the Shama Nav location and Clarendon uh, Street, we had about 75 employees. We went down oh. to about 15. Okay. <laughs> so, and then you said you know. you're you're doing you're possibly doing some renovations on the Clarendon space. Yeah, we're we're building out a bathroom there. Um, yeah. that we used to only be an employee bathroom, mm -hmm. um, and the city has again the, the the city has been amazing at giving us all this great outdoor seating, um, so that we um, we'll be putting in decks like we did at at Chamlet. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, and hopefully that'll be another month or so. It'll be done. All right, great, great. And then what do you see in store for you personally and professionally in the next, in your next chapter? What I don't know. Chapter should I'm getting be. kind of old for this. <laughs> but to tell you the truth, it's exhausting. And actually, the, what's been fun, um, a fun, I, I say, you know, there's a, there is a silver lining to everything, I suppose. Um, oh, I mean, there that, always that's, is. That's also part of my philosophy in life is that, Ours you know, too. You know yeah. I there's a think, reason for you know, everything. Is there's a reason for, for sure. everything. And it's, it's easier to be, for the, to see the glass half full than to see it half empty. Um, but to, not to be corny, but um, I've taken over the role of pretty much like, I hate to call it that because it sounds pretentious, but culinary director yeah. for the whole business. And um, so I've, you know, I have an amazing um, kitchen staff. Some mm -hmm. of them have been with me for like eight, nine, ten years. They've oh, been great. great and they've stuck through this whole thing and have been absolutely incredible um, and we have a great um, front of the house manager she's fantastic our director of operations is fantastic so mm -hmm. we've got a great team and all, all of our front of house staff in the cafe and the restaurant they really are terrific um, very lucky yeah in that way um, and I hope the new staff will be as well um, but I'm sure they will because that's obviously all under your direction and the people that, you know, the, the managers I, I just mentioned who we've hired, who I think, you know, share our philosophy. Yes. You know, I also believe in treating, like I did say about treating people um, with respect but, and dignity, about treating people fairly. People work mm -hmm. so hard in this business. Um, I know it even more than I ever did before in yeah. the past year and a half because I've been doing things myself. There are nights where I've been the cook in the kitchen and <laughs> there yep. where I've been, you know, the host or whatever, you know, if it's, if we didn't have the staff but um we uh, this no, this business is notorious for not treating people well and yeah. not paying people well mm -hmm. and you know i think people work hard and if you expect them to and also live up to your philosophy of providing great service and great quality yeah. then you have to pay them well so so we've been doing that too um and i i think that's that that's is something that restaurants are really going to have to you know step up and do a little bit more right. than they have done Yep. Uh, so good changes coming along. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> I think that kind of covers everything. I was going to um, think of uh, your goals, but those are your goals. That's your, your outlook. I love it. Um, I'm excited to see what happens over at Clarendon. And I'm glad you guys stuck through the whole COVID situation. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, we're only as good as, as our customers are, you know, who, who visit us and who, support us um, and there's so much so competition so for you to yeah. be around all these years um and do as well as you do kudos hats off well thank um, you that's why we wanted to have you on the show oh, well, as our first much. guest <laughs> right well thanks very much i mean i I've, I've enjoyed it and um uh i'm looking forward to the next phase all right us too. <laughs> awesome. thank you all right all well thank you for joining us as always um we will be back next week with another episode of live laugh love real estate Conversations with Lisa Loveland in Costa Hansis. Have a great Thank Memorial you. Weekend. <laughs>